طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Good evening uh, everybody Welcome to the best uh, of EULAR I am pleased to chair the pediatric uh, rheumatology session Tonight we will have uh, two presentations um, Give me, uh, give me uh, a great pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker, Dr. Reem Bakri. She will talk about uh, GIA 2020 uh, up to date. Uh, Dr. Reem Bakri, uh, she is a consultant of pediatric rheumatology. Uh, she did her uh, pediatric rheumatology training in Germany. I believe she's the only one in Saudi Arabia. She completed her training in Germany, which is a good addition. Uh, currently, she is a consultant uh, at uh, East uh, Jeddah Hospital, and she is a director of uh, the pediatric training program in that hospital. Dr. Reem. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizing committee and uh, special thank to Professor Suleiman al mayu for, in, for um, giving me the opportunity to um, be presenting in this uh, fruitful um, conference about the uh, best of EULA. Um, I will talk today about uh, um, 2020 update in uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis that was uh, presented in the, um, uh, the last EULA. Uh, my talk today will be um, in two parts. The first part will include uh, the systemic GIA, the approach of uh, therapeutic approach and the um, updates in the diagnosis. And the second part will be in um, treat to target. So um, first we're starting with the um, systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis definition, the ELA uh, criteria that we have in, uh, published in 2001 that we know which include the, which have the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. Uh, the inclusion is the arthritis, uh, which is present in the, before the age of 16, uh, birthday in one or more joints preceded by fever, and the characteristic of fever that we know from GIA, which is documented to be daily for three days and accompanied by one of more of the following, which is the non-fixed uh, evanescent erythematous rash, generalized lymphadenopathy, hepato, uh, and or splenomegaly and cirrhositis, and here are the, um, the exclusion criteria. Um, we have the old uh, Yagamushi um, classification criteria that has a sensitivity of 96% and a specificity of 92%. And it requires the presence of five criteria or more of these two major criteria. The major criteria including in Yamaguchi's uh, classification include fever uh, that lasts for one week and arthralgia for at least two weeks and typical uh, cutaneous rash and leukocytosis more than 10,000 predominantly um, neutrophils. Uh, minor criteria that interestingly included the adenophagy here and adenomegaly and, uh, and or splenomegaly, increased liver enzymes with a negative ANA rheumatoid factor, and we should exclude infections, neoplasm, and other systemic uh, diseases. The future classification criteria uh, had an, a specificity of 98% with a lower sensitivity of 80%. It requires four more major criteria or three major and two minor. And, and uh, this is the only criteria that has the um, pharyngitis as a major criteria. So up to now, there is um, um, a news, a, a lots of studies toward the new classification criteria for juvenile idiopathic arthritis. And up to now, we have the uh, definition of systemic GIA that includes fever of unknown origin, excluding infections, neoplastic or autoimmune disease, documented to be daily quotidian fever that rises to more than 39 degrees once a day and returns to normal between the uh, spikes of fever for three consecutive days uh, over um, a duration of at least two weeks and accompanied by two major criteria uh, or one major and two minor. Of these major are the arthritis and evanescent non-fixed erythematous rash 
and the minor include generalized lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, serocytis, arthralgia in the absence of arthritis, and leukocytosis with predominant neutrophils. Now I'm gonna talk about uh, biomarkers in systemic GIA. So we have some biomarkers that allow early diagnosis of systemic GIA, markers allowing early systemic GIA diagnosis of macrophage activation syndrome, and biomarkers that predict the response of specific ther therapies. So first, the biomarkers allowing early systemic GIA diagnosis. The objective was to detect early patients with systemic GIA who have no arthritis and falls in the category of fever of unknown origin. So those patients are usually have a late diagnosis leading to um, a late starting of therapy, um, probably um, um, a worse outcome. So with the analysis of S100 protein and other cytokines, the differentiation between systemic GIA and other differential diagnoses such as infection is a bit difficult but not possible. That was published in 2019. Here's a paper that was uh, published in 2009 about the myeloid-related protein 8 and 14 complex as a novel ligand of toll-like receptor for interleukin 1 beta from a positive feedback mechanism in systemic GIA. They concluded the analysis of MRP8, MRP14 in serums, an excellent tool for diagnosis of systemic GIA, allowing the, the early differentiation between um, systemic GIA and other inflammatory diseases and MRP8, MRP14, antinucleum 1 beta represents a novel positive feedback mechanism activating phagocytes by two major signaling pathway of innate immunity during the pathogenesis of systemic GIA. So, and, um, of the unbiased profiling for patients data published in 2009 that I showed uh, just now, the presence of CS100 protein in a very high concentration in patients with systemic GIA compared to those who had infections or leukemia, the level was not only high during the early onset of the disease, but also during flares. <clears throat> So uh, the second uh, um, uh, biomarker, the, the biomarkers are low in early systemic GIA macrophage activation syndrome diagnosis. It was noted by uh, um, a literature that was published in 2020 that the ADA2 activity, not the level, uh, was proven that increases the, in patients who present with macrophage activation syndrome while it is low in inactive and active disease. The interleukin-18 also was published in 2020. The, the, the level of interleukin-18 uh, was a sensitive biomarker for systemic GIA-associated mass, and uh, it was also high in, in active and inactive disease. So in case we have any systemic inflammation, there's an increase in level of cytokines, interleukins, especially interleukin-6, 1-beta, S100 protein. This will lead to an um, increase in level of interleukin-18, which is an inducer for interferon gamma. This will increase, sorry, the spelling mistake, the CXCL9, which leads to macrophage activation syndrome manifestation. Also, interferon gamma has an um, um, uh, uh, increased level interferon gamma with CXCL9, 10, and 11 is elevated in patients with macrophage activation syndrome compared to other uh, phases of systemic GIA, whether active or inactive disease. The third part is the biomarker predictor for therapeutic response. So biomarkers predicting response to interleukin-1 blocked. So we have a different biomarkers that increase during the baseline um, uh, presentation of um, systemic GIA, which include interleukin-18, interleukin-1, 6, 6, and etc. So after starting the therapy, some of these markers will show a rapid reduction within three days, and some will last into 15 days, in contrast that to interleukin-18, which has a bit slow reduction. Um, the high ratio of interleukin-18 to CXCL9 at baseline has a good production of a better response. An imbalance between interleukin-18 and interferon gamma, CXCL9 axis seems to affect the response to interleukin-1 blocker and increases the risk, the risk of macrophage activation syndrome manifestation. So I'm going to take you now to the therapeutic approach updated systemic GIA. So 
So we all know that the systemic GIA is still under the umbrella of juvenile idiopathic arthritis category, but we also, on the other hand, know that it is a a part of the acquired auto-inflammatory uh, disease. And it seems that the auto-antibodies and the auto-reactive T cells has no major role in the pathogenesis of systemic GIA. There's a lot of studies showing there's an HLA uh, association in systemic GIA, um, and the innate immune system versus the adaptive immune system shows that there's an increase in the antileukins, antileukin 6 and, um, and um, 18, increase in systemic and in S100 protein, and it seems that the role of natural killer cells, monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils are very high in the pathogenesis of systemic GI8. It also, increase it, it, it shows that there is an increase in the level of these uh, monocytes and these cells in the, in the beginning uh, of in the early presentation of systemic GI8. So here's a graph that shows um, um, in the early phase of acute um, systemic GIA, the, it, it seems that the innate immunity is the card, plays the cardinal role in the pathogenesis of systemic GIA, with the presence of antileukin one, antileukin six are the major um, um, the major cytokines that leads to manifestation of systemic GIA. So it was hypothesized that an early um, an early treatment of these patients with anti interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 blocker in the early phase of the disease uh, will lead to a better response rather than those with uh, chronic arthritis. Here at this point, we need to um, probably sometimes add another medications um, um, uh, for the treatment for better response. So what supports this hypothesis is uh, lots of studies has been done. I'm going to uh, show a couple of them. So the first one is the um, the Anakendra and systemic GIA single um, center experience. They concluded that Anakendra is associated with rapid attainment of inactive disease in a significant portion of patients. They found that the early treatment associated is associated with better outcome. Um, however, formal studies on early, on early treatment and on the pathophysiology and response to treatment, including Anakendra, of early and late onset GIA are needed to optimize the management of the challenging disease. And it shows that in this study, one of the factors that predisposed to achieve early remission was the timing from the onset of the disease to starting the anakendra. So what the, what the, uh, the, one of the cohorts had started the anakendra in the meantime of 1.9 months, showed better response compared to those who started uh, of 24 months. The Utrecht uh, cohort um, um, study of systemic GI patient, as of they, they started treatment as a monotherapy with anakendra. They had the prospective cohort that started in 2008. They had uh, so far 55 patients, and all of these 55 patients received standard follow up and standard sampling, and they had followed the treat to target strategy. So a reminder of the systemic GIA treat to target strategy, they started the patients on non states initially, and after two days, if the patient has persistent fever, they will start him on anakinra in, in a dose of two milligram per kilogram per day. So um, if the fever persisted after three days, then they, they had uh, doubled the dose, uh, and if the uh, fever resolved, then the, um, it will remain the same dose for, for three months. So if he had the, the patient had still fe fever on day seven, they would add a concomitant therapy of steroid or methotrexate, or can they switch to another biologic? In day 90, if they still have an active disease or any flares of disease, they also had started a concomitant therapy. <clears throat> So the, uh, the, the follow-up data showed that um, at one year, there is um, 50, almost 54% had inactive disease and they were off medication, and more than 72% had uh, inactive disease in three years and five years. And it showed that 85% had inactive disease and they were on medication as far as in, in as early as three months. Same cohort showed there is a prediction for, for inactive disease at 12 months with the neutrophil count. The higher the neutrophil count at presentation, this is nine. So the higher the neutrophil count at presentation told shows a better response and um, reaching an inactive disease in one year in, in like 
um, uh, 29 patients compared to those who have a low neutrophil count. Uh, they had an active disease, eight of them at, uh, at one year. So the same cohort was also analyzed to define the outcome with or without um, arthritis. So 30 patients had arthritis, where 12 patients had no arthritis. And they say they, they had the same other presentation, same uh, lab uh, um, results at the, at the baseline. Uh, so here's the ELR fulfilling the, with arthritis and without arthritis. So it showed almost the same result or outcome. Um, around more than 70% had uh, inactive disease by three months and more than 50% had inactive disease by uh, six months. And this support the idea that the arthritis is not really a major uh, characteristic of systemic GIA. So, um, I think most of us has this scenario. What if the patient received um, um, IL-6 and IL-1 blockers, but they still have an active disease? They failed treatment. So what are our options of treatment? Sorry, I'm gonna skip the slide here. <coughs> So data from clinical trials that was published in 2012 showed patients who received canakinumab and tocilizumab had a good response with the absence of fever and they reached ACR 90 and um, around more than 50% of patients who received tocilizumab and canakinumab had a clinical inactive disease. In contrast to patients who had canakinumab and tocilizumab also had um, the same medications but they failed treatment more than 40%. And another patients failed to achieve glucocorticoids tapering uh, with these medications. <clears throat> so here, uh, Vas Vestert uh, defined the uh, definition of resistance or refractory systemic GIA. So those patients who, who failed response to IL-1 and IL-6 inhibitor resulting in steroid dependence and the presence of persistent destructive arthritis and a recurrent macrophage activation syndrome more than one and the presence of interstitial lung disease. So I'm going to go back here because I think there's... Yeah, so the first one is IL-18. We know all the IL-18 is a pleiotropic cytokines involved in the regulation of innate and adaptive immune response. High serum level of IL-18 plays a role in predisposing patients with O2 inflammatory disease to develop macrophage activation syndrome. An imbalance between interleukin-18 and interleukin-18 um, binding protein, which is the inhibitor of interleukin-18, with high level of free interleukin-18 plays a role in the pathogenesis of macrophage activation syndrome and as a cofactor uh, for inducing uh, interferon gamma. The neutralization of interleukin-18, interferon gamma axis, is a promising strategy in treating macrophage activation syndrome. <coughs> So here's um, um, open label multicenter um, dose escalated in phase two. It's a trial for um, anti interleukin 18, tadeginic, uh, that is done in adult onset cell disease. The outcome was not really satisfactory, and the joint improvement was only by 20%, but there is a good improvement with the CRP um, reduction. And the only um, uh, study that was done in pediatric age group is a case report. Um, um, for a patient had a long, long-standing uh, disease uh, duration, interstitial lung disease, and recurrent severe macrophage activation syndrome following treatment with tadeganic, he had a stabilization of disease course and reduced macrophage activation syndrome severity, and the, the steroid was were able to be reduced from two milligram to 0.7 milligram per kilogram, and improvement of linear growth. And the macrophage activation syndrome occurred again, but with uh, uh, it can be, it was easily managed. The JAK inhibitors is another option. The, the JAK inhibitors are very important in clinical function. They are not specific because they interact with a number of receptors and their inhibition leads to severe clinical phenotypes in human and animal. Interleukin 1 and interleukin receptors do not signal through JAK inhibitor, so we need to know this because it, it acts in a, in a different pathway. So the, the objective of JAK inhibition is not to block the pathway completely, but to reverse and reduce the activity of one or more JAK isoform.
So uh, here's a case report was done in from China uh, of uh, using the tofacitinib as a JAK inhibitor for a patient who failed uh, glucocorticoids, methotrexate, and etanercept. Um, uh, this patient did not receive any IL-1 or IL-6 blocker. After six months of treatment, the JDOS went down from 40 to less than one, and uh, steroids were able to be withdrawn. And there's two ongoing uh, studies about uh, partisanib and tofacitinib, all expected to be completed in, 2000, uh, in 2023. So um, here's, um, now I'm going to talk about systemic GIA, including interstitial lung disease. So it was noted lately that interstitial lung disease, a very common presentation of macrophage activation syndrome. And it was noted that high level of ferritins is present uh, in those with the macrophage activation syndrome and interstitial lung disease more compared to those who did not have interstitial lung disease. These are the, some articles were published about interstitial lung disease. Someone can look at it later on. So um, it was, uh, this is a single uh, case report that, um, that, that used um, roxolitinib as for systemic GIA with interstitial lung disease. Uh, the patient failed an akinra, kinakinumab, and tocilizumab. After 15 months of treatment, he had a normalized inflammatory marker, no fever, uh, steroids were decreased, improved pulmonary function test with improved CT finding. So um, anti-interferon gamma also in treating uh, macrophage activation syndrome. There's a growing evidence of data showing interferon gamma may be the common final mediator of different causes leading to macrophage activation syndrome. Uh, this is um, the impalumab in children with primary hemophagocytic lymphocytosis showed a very good uh, outcome. And this is an ongoing study on anti-interferon anti gamma. It's a, uh, the payload open la label single arm multicenter study to evaluate the safety, tolerability, pharmacokinetic and efficacy of intravenous uh, impalumab, anti-interferon gamma monoclonal antibody in patients with systemic GIA associated with mass who failed standard uh, care with high dose of steroids. And uh, this is one of the abstracts that were presented in EULA. It's the first study exploring a targeted therapy in macrophage activation syndrome. It included nine patients showing a rapid neutralization of interferon gamma as demonstrated by CXCL9 reduction and complete response in all nine, actually. Six of them received um, remission after four weeks and the, uh, and the nine, all of them after eight weeks who failed the previous conventional therapy. Uh, the, the, this treatment was well tolerated with a minor side effect of mild infections. Now I'm going to move to the second talk of uh, today's presentation, is the treat to target. So the rationale and the, and underlying the treat to target in chronic arthritis. So we have a replacement with the pyramid-based approach with the concept that early therapy offers dramatic advantages in the outcome. And with the, the presence of the era of the new medications and biologic, we were able to increase ability to attain disease remission. And if remission is achieved uh, and sustained, we were able to stop the progression of joint damage, development of outcome measures that correlate well with the progression of joint damage and with the uh, physical function, uh, demonstration of the superior efficacy of intensive management strategy with therapeutic changes driven by disease activity measure versus unguided treatment approach. So hey, this is a reminder of the, the treat-to-target rationale and strategy. So first, when the patient presents with a chronic arthritis, we should um, aim the, uh, our target. So the, the target is to achieve and maintain a tight disease control and to set the therapeutic tar target, whether remission or low disease activity in some conditions, and adjust therapy accordingly if the target is not reached or lost at any time. So um, early in the last couple of uh, years, we were able to, um, to see an advances in management of GIA. So with the early starting of methotrexate in those patients and the wide use of intraarticular steroid and the introduction of biologics and DMARDs, so um, remission has become an attainable goal for most, if not all, patients.
slides are not moving so quickly. So here's some published uh, studies showing that over the three years, patients who had JDOS below the cutoff for inactive disease in one or more visits had lesser radiographic progression than patients who never achieved inactive disease by JDOS. Slides are not moving quickly. So this is the Wallace uh, class, um, criteria for uh, the clinical inactive disease, as we have the no joint with active arthritis and no fever or, or, or systemic manifestation, no active uveitis, normal level of inflammatory markers, the physician global assessment of disease activity score of best possible on scale use, and the duration of morning stiffness less than 15 minutes. So the patients were labeled um, clinical remission on medications or off medication based on the presentation in, in six months with or without treatment. Dr. Arim, I'm afraid we are almost uh, approaching the time. So. Okay. Um, so we're going to go quick. So this is uh, the um, uh, the JDAS that we have and we use, including physic the physician global assessment, the parents and the active joint uh, count, acute face reactant and score range. And we have the clinical JDAS, which exclude inflammatory markers that can be used. Um, so I'm going to skip this one, the cutoff values. We have the systemic um, a systemic JDOS that, that added a fifth uh, value of the systemic manifestation score, which is uh, scored upon the presentation, fever, rash, lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly, suicidus, anemia, and platelet count. So do you have two minutes or, or shall I stop? So let me just go for the recommendation of um, the recommendation of, of treat to target is the primary target for treatment of patients with GIA is a clinical remission, which means that the absence of signs and symptoms of inflammatory disease activity, including the extra articular manifestation. Minimal disease activity or low disease activity may be alternative target, particularly in patients with long-standing disease. And the setting the target, selecting the tools and therapeutic decision should be based on the individual patient characteristic and agreed upon the patients and the parents. Disease activity should be assessed and documented regularly using a validated composite instrument. This is the last slide. Uh, I'm not going to edit this. So. And the frequency of assessment depends on the category of GIA, level of disease activity, and the presence of extra articular manifestation. And all patients, uh, more, more than 50% improvement in disease activity should be reached within three months and target within six months, and those with system GIA should have no fever attained within one week, and the treatment should be adjusted until the target is achieved. And once the treatment target has been achieved, it should be sustained, and ongoing monitoring should occur into maintenance of the target. So I'm going to conclude now, or I can... The slides are not moving quickly, that's why, so... So, um, um, for in conclusion, markers allowing early systemic GIA diagnosis are MRP-8, interleukin-18. Markers relevant to mass and HLH are S100 protein, interleukin-18, ferritin, interferon gamma, CXL9, and ADO2 activity. And markers relatively specific for systemic GIA and macrophage activation syndrome are interleukin-18 and S100 protein. Elevated markers of innate immune activity better response to, shows better response to anti-inflammatory therapies. And this balance of the interleukin-18, interferon gamma, and CXL9 axis seems to affect the response to interleukin-1 blocker and increase the risk of macrophage activation syndrome. And a systemic GI is a complex auto-inflammatory disease in which IL-1-mediated inflammation may be the cardinal pathway early in the disease course and advances in the management of, of GIA with using treat-to-target approach instead of the pyramid-based approach made remission attainable for most if not all patients, and thank you so much. Thank you, Doctora. You know, it's a difficult task to do all this in half an hour or maybe less, but you it did is. great. Thank you very much, Doctora. Thank you probably, so much. Probably we have one, maybe time for one or two questions. Uh, I don't see question here, but uh, just correct me, Doctora, the new criteria for systemic GIA 
is an is a proposal. It's not in practice yet. Yes, yes, it is in pros a proposal. Yeah. And, it was even, even, mm -hmm. and they mentioned they want to keep systemic GIA under GIA or autoimmune. They don't want to move it to autoinflammatory. Auto autoimmune. Yes, exactly. Okay. So other question, just just. I mean, they are talking about uh, early treatment. From your review, what is the definition of early treatment? So um, early treatment depends on the... Um, um, so in the first presentation, we should uh, have our own target based on the treat-to-target uh, strategy. We should have our target. Um, so if we want to, um, if, for example, systemic GIA, um, they should be free of fever within one week. And um, for, let's say, uh, the other types of, uh, of uh, GIAs, then we should have, um, based on the uh, JDAs and the, 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 the assessment that we have, so, um, 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 so we have a t you should have a target of time. Okay. We should have a target of our time, yes. Thank you, Doctora. Thank you so much. Great job. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much. We will move to the second uh, presentation by Dr. Abdelaziz Arwais. Um, Dr. Abdelaziz, he will do a more difficult uh, task because he will talk about pediatric rheumatology in EULR 2020, what is new. means he will talk about different entities, but I'm sure he will do it in great way. Uh, Dr. Abdelaziz is a senior registrar at uh, Prince Sultan Military Medical City, Riyadh. He completed his uh, pediatric rheumatology training uh, at King uh, Abdelaziz uh, Medical City, National Guard, Riyadh. Um, without further delay, I will leave the mic for Dr. Abdelaziz to talk. Thanks, uh, Professor Suleiman, for the introduction. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Salatu salam ala ashraf al-anbiya al-mursaleen, nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Dear colleagues, good evening all. It's my pleasure to be presenting to you today. And uh, my uh, talk will be about pediatric rheumatology in ULAR 2020, what's new? Of course, 45 minutes will not be uh, enough to cover all the topics. Dr. Rima, uh, thankfully, did very well and covered the topic of uh, GIA. And my task is to cover other topics in pediatric rheumatology. So uh, I will start with uh, my first topic, which is systemic lupus erythematosus. Uh, SLE actually uh, had a good number of sessions during the previous uh, ULAR meeting. And uh, they covered the topic starting from the pathogenesis and ending up with the treatment. Actually, the treatment part had two separate sessions talking about advances, advances in uh, lupus treatment and lupus nephritis treatment. And I think this reflects how important is this topic. That's why I elected to start with uh, this topic. And you will see that major part of my presentation is covering uh, lupus uh, treatment and lupus nephritis treatment. So uh, we start, Mila, with the multi-targeted therapy in SLE. Uh, what do we mean by uh, multi-target uh, therapy? Actually, this terminology was adapted from this uh, randomized controlled trial that was published in uh, 2015. Uh, in this trial, the, uh, the multi-target therapy was studied as adding tacrolimus to microphenolate mufetil and steroids for induction treatment of lupus nephritis. Uh, the main focus of this presentation was on calcineurin inhibition in lupus nephritis patients. And the reason of that, because all the randomized trials on calcineurin inhibition were done on uh, lupus nephritis patients. Uh, as we know, calcineurin inhibition is a widely established effective immunosuppressant. And uh, a number of data and analyses, and meta-analyses, sorry, uh, suggest that calcineurin inhibitors, either alone or as a, as a part of the multi-target uh, regimen, may have a favorable efficacy to, uh, to toxicity ratio in uh, lupus nephritis management. So far, we have three generations of, uh, or of uh, calcineurin inhibitors. The first generation is the cyclosporine A. The second generation is the tacrolimus, and the third generation is the bocrosporin. Uh, as we see in this slide, it summarizes the comparison between all these generations in terms of efficacy and toxicity. 
However, it's worth to mention that efficacy and toxicity issue is a matter of dosing in regards to these generations. And we can see by each generation this issue is improving. Let's talk about uh, tacrolimus uh, for uh, a while. Uh, it's a second generation uh, calcineurin inhibitor, as we say. And so far, it's the widely used uh, calcineurin inhibitor uh, in the treatment of lupus nephritis patients. And the reason behind that is that uh, it is well studied and uh, many uh, of uh, papers uh, shown its uh, efficacy in treatment of lupus nephritis uh, patients. However, the downside uh, in its efficacy is that it's not studied yet in international multi-ethnic uh, trials. Uh, in regards to the third generation Vocrisporin, it looks promising in future. However, uh, its uh, further data is uh, needed uh, on a long-term uh, effect on uh, patients with lupus nephritis. And it's uh, actually uh, under review to be approved for use in uh, lupus nephritis patients. And as we see, it has a better uh, toxicity profile as compared to the other generations. Okay, move now to the second part, uh, which is this study about uh, the long-term outcome of randomized control trial comparing tacrolimus with microphenolate mofetil as induction therapy of severe lupus nephritis. At the right side of the screen, we can see the original study that was published in 2015 by the Chinese group. And here we have to compliment our uh, Asian colleagues uh, for being uh, a front runner in investigating uh, the use of calcineurin inhibitors, mainly tacrolimus, uh, in, uh, in treating patients with lupus nephritis. So in uh, ULAR this year, they presented their 10-year outcome study on the same cohort of patients. Uh, they looked at uh, many factors. Uh, first thing, they looked uh, at the differences in renal flares, also, they looked for a composite outcome for poor prognosis, including reduction in GFR by 30% or more, uh, chronic kidney disease, stage 4 or 5, mortality due to any cause. Uh, also, they looked for factors associated with poor renal outcome at 10 years, and they looked for the threshold of renal parameters that best predict the renal outcome at 10 years. Well, so the original study included 150 patients. And around 80% of patients had a good clinical response and we are maintained on azathioprine. However, a few number of patients uh, required a re-induction with rescue therapies, either cyclophosphamide or shifting from MMF to tacrolimus or vice versa, or adding either tacrolimus or macrophenolate mofetil to each other. Here in this graph, we can see uh, the frequency of renal, uh, renal flares over time. And we can see that there is no difference between both groups, tacrolimus and microphenolate groups. However, we, uh, we should mention that the proteinuric flares were more significantly in the tacrolimus group as compared to the microphenolate group. This slide shows the uh, risk to develop uh, renal flare over time. And we can see that in, in both uh, figures, there is no difference between both groups, tacrolimus and microphenolate groups, in, in, in this uh, table. This uh, figure also shows the risk uh, uh, to develop a renal flare over time, in, specifically in patients with pure membranous lobus nephritis. And again, we can see no difference uh, between the two groups uh, in this study. Okay, the group also did ROC curve analysis for the duration of maintenance therapy and as a predictive of renal flare in future. And they found that a cutoff of 62.5 months of maintenance therapy duration is a good predictor for renal flares with a specificity and sensitivity of 77%. Now we go to this uh, slide, which shows the composite clinical outcomes at uh, the last visit. And in a, as co in a comparison of two groups, we saw no significant difference between each group. Even when we see each component individually, we can see no difference between both tacrolimus or uh, microphenolate groups. This slide is to show also the risk to develop uh, the poor uh, renal outcome uh, uh, over time. And again, there is no significant difference between both groups, tacrolimus and MMF. 
The group also did a uh, study and uh, they checked the uh, renal parameters over multiple points of time. Uh, the aim of that is to, uh, to detect uh, the point of time and the value of each parameter that can predict uh, the risk to, for long-term uh, renal uh, prognosis. And they found that a urine protein creatinine ratio at 18 months with a cut limit of 0.75 is a best predictor for a long-term renal uh, prognosis. Also, the GFR uh, at 18 months with a cut limit of 80 ml per minute is also a good predictor for a long-term renal prognosis. Here they say, uh, we can see that uh, the effect of renal response at uh, month 18 on the probability of developing uh, or having poor outcome. And we can see that Patients who fail to attain response by 18 months are at higher risk to develop uh, poor renal outcomes as compared to those who attain the renal response by month 18. Again, uh, the uh, group showed uh, or did the uh, Cook's uh, reg uh, regression uh, to check for the factors associated with poor composite outcomes. And they found that relapse uh, of disease plus the GFR level at uh, six months and lack of response at six months are uh, uh, single independent or uh, best independent uh, factors that can uh, be associated with a poor composite outcome. Uh, a renal biopsy was repeated uh, for a uh, total of 40 patients, but the data of 36 patients uh, are available uh, in this study. They repeated the renal biopsy after renal uh, flares. And as we see, no difference between both groups in the chronicity score, either at entry or on the repeated uh, renal biopsy. In regard to the extra renal flares uh, over uh, all time of the study, also there was no significant difference between uh, both groups. Also, in regards to damage score, there was no difference between tacrolimus and microphenolate uh, mufti groups. However, those patients who uh, lack response at six months and 12 months were at risk or higher risk to develop uh, a, a, damage, a higher damage score uh, than the others. So, in conclusion, tacrolimus is not inferior to microphenolate or mufitil in the induction therapy for lupus nephrites in terms of renal flares. And uh, renal flares are common, and maintenance of therapy for five years or less is the best to predict renal flare and uh, the, also protein, uh, urine protein creatine ratio of 0.75 or more and GFR of 80 ml uh, per minute or less at 18 months. Post therapy is predictive of poor renal outcomes. Also, there is the increase in histology uh, chronicity score is not significantly different between both groups and the relapsed renal disease and lower G, uh, GFR and the lack of renal response at six months, as we mentioned, are independently associated with a poorer outcome. Now I will move to the 2019 update uh, on the, of the EULA recommendation uh, uh, guidelines for the management of lupus nephritis. Of course, we will not go through all the details. However, it's worth to mention that the first recommendations were published in 2015 and was done by a multidisciplinary panel of rheumatologists, nephrologists, renal pathologists, and pediatricians. Uh, over the last seven years, new evidence has emerged and that included uh, the use of calcineurin inhibitors and multi-target therapy, as we mentioned in the initial uh, part of our presentation. Also, uh, new advances in disease monitoring and treatment targets uh, emerged. That's the reason behind the, uh, updating the uh, ULAR uh, uh, criteria. Okay, as I mentioned, I will not go through all the details. However, I try to highlight the new updates or, or the most, most significant change in uh, the new recommendations, starting with the goal of treatment. As compared to the previous version, the goal of treatment in 2019 uh, recommendation, uh, recommendations uh, was further defined uh, according to time since treatment initiation. As we see uh, in uh, section 4.1, that a significant improvement or evidence of improvement in proteinuria 
must be attained by three months with at least 25%. Also, at least 50% of uh, reduction in proteinuria should be achieved by six months. And this is defined as a patch of clinical response. Uh, by 12 months, uh, a level of urine protein creatine ratio should be targeted below 500 up to 700 milligram per gram. And this is defined as complete clinical response. And the reason between, uh, behind specifying 12 months for that is that because that uh, post hoc analyses of the maintain and neuro lupus nephritis trials suggest that a protein urea level at 12 months is the single best predictor of long term renal outcomes. And here we mean uh, the risk of developing end stage renal uh, uh, or end stage kidney disease and also doubling of uh, serum creatine level over 10 years. In section 4.2, we note that they, they mentioned that patients with nephrotic range proteinuria at baseline may require an additional six to 12 months to reach the complete clinical response. And this means that patients with nephrotic range proteinuria, we, in, in these patients, we need to extend our aforementioned time frames for more six to 12 months. And the reason between, uh, behind that is that because the slower recovery of proteinuria. So also it's worth to mention that once we consider decreasing in the level of proteinuria, this can avoid a premature change in the treatment. So uh, in patients with protein, uh, range of proteinuria, we need to extend our goals of treatment. Okay, in regards to initial treatment, as we mentioned uh, earlier in our presentation, that combination of MMF with a calcineurin inhibitor, especially tacrolimus, has uh, uh, showed a good benefit. And now this is a new statement added to 2019 update. But here they mentioned that it is an alternative, which means that they didn't suggest that uh, it can be uh, a universally uh, recommended first-line treatment. Uh, and the reason behind that, because uh, of, uh, the, of lack of data in non-Asian populations and lack of data of long-term use of calcineurin inhibitors in uh, patients. But however, this is a new statement was added to this uh, version of uh, EULAR recommendations. In regard to uh, non-responding or refractory disease, uh, a new statement regarding bilimumab was added and they say that bilimumab may be considered as add-on treatment to facilitate glucocorticoid sparing, to control the extrarenal lupus activity, and to decrease the risk for extrarenal flares. And here we carry the question that whether bilimumab effect is limited only to, glu uh, to glucocorticoid sparing and to extrarenal manifestation, or is, can it go behind that and also show some effect on renal outcomes. Before we answer this question, we will talk briefly about bilimumab. It is, uh, bilimumab is a monoclonal antibody uh, directed against uh, the B lymphocyte stimulator protein, which is block, uh, blocking it from uh, binding to the receptor on B cell uh, lymphocytes. And uh, this will inhibit the B cell mediated immunity and decrease the autoimmune response. As we know, on April 2019, uh, bilimumab became the first treatment to get FDA approval for use in pediatric patients with systemic lupus erythematosus, and it was uh, approved for patients aging from 5 up to 17 years. This study will answer our uh, just mentioned qu uh, question. Uh, this is uh, bliss uh, lim uh, lymphonephritis, uh, uh, lymph. Uh, a lupus nephritis study. It is a randomized double blinded placebo controlled phase three trial. And the reason uh, behind uh, studying the effect of bilimumab on lupus nephritis was because of the successful outcomes that were uh, noted in both phase two trial, uh, phase uh, in the both uh, phase three trials, BLIS 52 and BLIS 76. Uh, uh, post hoc analyses of these trials demonstrated improvement in renal parameters in patients who were having uh, 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 impaired renal uh, uh, parameters or uh, renal involvement at, at baseline of the treatment. 
This is the design of the study. Uh, an entry to the study required uh, patients who are aging 18 years or uh, above, and the uh, patient should be having uh, clinically active lupus nephritis, defined as urine protein creatine ratio of one, one or more, and uh, renal uh, biopsy with evidence of lupus nephritis, either uh, proliferative, membranous, or mixed proliferative and membranous. Randomization of uh, patients was done based on one-to-one -one ratio in both arms of the study. The first arm was bilimumab, 10 milligram per kg IV plus the standard therapy, and the other arm is the placebo plus the standard therapy. And a unique feature of this study that uh, patients could be either uh, uh, receive induction either uh, with MMF plus steroid or with the uh, urolupus sacrophosphamide protocol plus steroid. In regards to those patients who received uh, hydrocortisone plus sacrophosphamide, they were maintained on low dose corticosteroid and azathioprine. And for those patients who received high dose corticosteroid and MMF, were maintained with low dose corticosteroid and MMF. Okay. Uh, uh, here we can see the primary endpoint at week 104, uh, primary efficacy renal response, and the key secondary endpoints, complete renal response, time to re uh, renal related event or death, and the ordinary renal response. And it's worth to mention that by week 24, to require, uh, to acquire uh, a definition of responder, the dose of steroid should be no higher than 10 milligram per day. In this slide, uh, we see the definitions of the uh, primary uh, uh, endpoints and the key secondary uh, outcomes, uh, but for the sake of time, we'll not go through it. Here we come to the results. Uh, 446 patients were divided in uh, both arms of this study. 26% uh, of patients received uh, sacrophosphamide induction, while around 73% received uh, microfinulate uh, induction. And in regards to the baseline characteristics, they were balanced between both groups. Uh, however, uh, patient, uh, patients with uh, lupus uh, or uh, clear uh, or pure proliferative uh, lupus nephritis accounted for 60% of the population and 24% uh, were having mixed proliferative and membranous and 16% were having membranous uh, pure membranous lupus nephritis. Uh, and regard, in regards to the uh, median uh, urine protein creatine ratio level, it was 2.5. However, 40% of patients were having a urine protein creatine ratio of three or more. We can see here in this uh, slide that uh, in terms of uh, week 104, a primary efficacy renal response and complete renal response, that all achieved statistical significance. And also in terms of time uh, or uh, in terms of treatment difference, it was around 11% in each point favoring uh, bilimumab over the placebo group. In terms of uh, times to arena related event or death, it was 50% less in the bilimumab group. And in, in terms of the ordinary arena response, which was mainly driven by the complete response, also it achieved a significant uh, 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 or clinical statistical significance in favor of Bilimuma. These two figures show uh, the primary efficacy renal response. Uh, we can see as early as 24 weeks, the separation between two curves. And here uh, we see that uh, the time uh, to primary efficacy renal response maintained throughout uh, the duration of the study is clinically significant in favor of same figures, but they, uh, they are talking about the complete renal response, and again, they are showing that bilimumab is superior to the placebo group. In terms of time to renal-related event or death, we can see that the risk to develop uh, uh, renal-related event or death is 50% less in the bilimumab group as compared to the placebo group. Uh, and uh, it was mainly driven by the renal worsening and the uh, treatment failure uh, related to renal uh, disease. In regards to safety, there was no outstanding safety issues uh, in regards to the bilimumab. 
So in a conclusion, this is the largest lupus nephritis study to date. Uh, data from this uh, lupus nephritis demonstrate that pinumumab plus standard therapy significantly improved multiple uh, lupus nephritis renal responses versus standard therapy alone, while maintaining an acceptable safety profile. And by the way, pinumumab is going to be submitted for approval this year for use in lupus nephritis. So I think by uh, th this uh, couple of uh, data, we can answer that uh, our question that bilumumab is having a good and significant efficacy in uh, renal outcomes in lupus patients. There was also an interesting talk about uh, three to target experiences with bilumumab in systemic lupus uh, erythematosus by Dr. Andrea Doria. I will not go through it. However, Dr. Doria brought many studies talking about uh, the efficacy of use of bilimumab in uh, lupus patients in general, including real-life study. Among these real-life studies is their uh, recent study, which uh, included 24 centers and more than 460 patients. And he summarized his presentation that bilimumab increases the probability for achieving remission and low disease activity in SLE patient. And also in their study, uh, uh, there is a novel evidence that an earlier use of bilimumab in patients with active SLE and low, and low damage may maximize its efficacy in clinical practice. Now we'll move to targeting interferons in SLE. As we know, interferon pathways and mainly type 1 interferon has been implicated in the pathogenesis of multiple of rheumatic diseases, including uh, systemic uh, lupus erythematosus, among others. In this slide, <clears throat> we can see the components of the interferon system. It's composed of triggers, interferon producing cells and sensors, interferons themselves, target cells, and the pathway activation. And targeting any part of these can affect the production of interferon and decrease the autoimmune response. First of all, I'd like to talk about the plasma cytoid dendritic cells. These, are, these cells are central in the uh, interferon system, and they predominantly produce the interferon alpha. Also, they contribute to immune homeostasis and protect us from viral infections. These uh, cells are having low frequency, but they have a, a high capability to produce a large amount of interferons within a short period of time. Plasma cytoid dendritic cells express multiple molecules. Among them is the BDCA2 molecule, which is specific for plasma cytoid dendritic cells. OK. Now we want to target the interferon producing cells. And here we are talking about the, the plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And we can target it by targeting its exclusively expressed molecule BDCA2. So here we use uh, anti-BDCA2 agent. And anti-BDCA2 agent uh, is an uh, antibody against the BDCA2 molecule. It uh, uh, binds to the molecule and internalizes uh, the molecule which leads to inhibition of TLR7 and 9 induced uh, interferon production. In a phase one uh, trial, uh, a single dose of 20 milligram per kg was given to, pa uh, to patients. And interferon signature in whole blood reduced by 50% within 24 hours only. And also there was a reduction in class scores at four, week four and week 12. And here we can see in the left figure, that in the placebo group, only one patient out of four had uh, a good response. While in the anti-BDCA2 antibody, six out of eight patients were considered as responders. Also during uh, this previous ULAR meeting, uh, the results of the phase two trial uh, for the anti-BDCA2 antibody was uh, presented in a session uh, or a live session about the dendritic cells. Uh, they used uh, the anti-BDCA2 antibody in uh, patients with cutaneous lupus erythematosus. They enrolled 132 patients with cutaneous lupus erythematosus, including chronic and subacute subtypes, with or without systemic manifestations. And they, they investigated uh, the doses 50 milligram, 150 milligram, and 450 milligram doses 
that we're given subcutaneously every four weeks with an additional dose at week two. They looked, uh, the primary endpoint was uh, a dose response uh, to the antibody as measured uh, by percent change from the baseline at the class score at week 16. And patients with active cutaneous lupus erythematosus statistically significant uh, or had statistically significant dose-related improvement in disease activity versus the placebo group with no untoward safety signals. Now we will move to targeting sensors of nucleic acid. Among these sensors are the toll-like receptors. And we can see here in the picture in the left, the immune complex uh, inside uh, the endosome uh, triggering, uh, triggering the TLR7 and 9. And we can see also, or we have the uh, signaling cascade, including the IRAC4. And IRAC4 is uh, standing for interleukin-1 receptor associated kinase 4. And by inhibiting this uh, molecule, we can inhibit the uh, signaling cascade. And uh, in the picture on the right, we can see that Dr. Hurton uh, studied uh, this uh, in her lab. They, she used uh, plasma cytodendritic cells from healthy blood donors and stimulated them with uh, SLA immune complexes, as we see uh, here in the red. When she added the IRAC4 inhibitor, we can see a significant reduction in interferon, uh, interferon production in a similar matter when she added the hydroxychloroquine. Okay, now we are talking about targeting interferon alpha itself. We are targeting uh, interferon alpha with uh, interferon alpha keynote. It is uh, an immune uh, therapeutic vaccine composed of inactivated recombinant human interferon alpha 2b coupled to uh, a T helper carrier protein. Interferon alpha keynote induces neutralizing anti interferon alpha antibodies. And it was recently uh, studied in a phase two trial, and the inclusion criteria was positive interferon signature. Intramuscular injections were given at these different points of time. Interferon uh, alpha quinoid uh, induced neutralizing anti interferon uh, alpha 2b serum antibodies in 91% of treated patients with uh, and uh, reduced uh, and it reduced the interferon gene signature significantly however the primary endpoint at week 36 was modified pickler but unfortunately it was not met because as we see the response rate in the interferon uh, alpha quinoid was 40 percent and in the placebo was 34 percent and, th and there was no sig uh, statistical uh, significant difference However, in terms of sec secondary endpoint, and here we are talking about LL DAS, it was uh, uh, it achieved uh, statistical significance, as we can see here. Also, more than half of patients treated with interferon alpha quinoid uh, developed neutralizing antibodies to a number of interferon alpha subtypes. And now we will talk about targeting the activation pathways. And here, uh, here specifically, we are talking about JAK-STAT signaling pathway. Actually, there was a separate talk about JAK inhibition in SLA. And again, for the sake of time, uh, I cannot go through it in details. However, it's worth to mention that there are at least four ongoing studies on JAK inhibitions uh, in, uh, for SLA in the clinical development. Okay, now we'll talk about targeting the target cells. And here we target the target cells by blocking the type, in, uh, type 1 interferon receptor by an agent called anifrolumab, which is an antibody that binds to the type 1 interferon receptor and blocks signaling by type 1 uh, interferon. Anifrolumab actually was well studied in uh, uh, three large double blind uh, randomized controlled studies. Two out of them are uh, phase three studies, TULIP-1 and TULIP-2. This is TULIP-1 study, which was published last year in, Lance, uh, in Lancet uh, Rheumatology Journal. And this year, TULIP-2 was uh, published in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine. There was also an interesting uh, presentation uh, about early and sustained responses with anifrolumab treatment in patients with active systemic lupus erythematosus in two phase three 
trials. Uh, both studies, TULIP-1 and TULIP-2, are randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. They evaluated the efficacy and safety of anifrolumab 300 mg every four weeks over 52 weeks in patients with moderately to severely uh, active uh, uh, systemic uh, lupus erythematosus who were receiving standard of care treatment. They evaluated the, uh, the time to onset of picular response that was sustained from attainment uh, through uh, week 52 of the study. We can see here in this figure, it displays the time to onset of picular response that was sustained from attainment through week 52 in both TULIP-1 and TULIP-2 studies. And we can see here that both uh, curves separate nicely as early as four weeks in favor of uh, anifrolumab in both studies. And we can see that at each uh, point of time, there is additional number of patients who attain a big, uh, attain the, the picular response and sustained it uh, throughout the 50 weeks uh, duration of the study. In a conclusion of this uh, uh, presentation, uh, a greater proportion of patients achieved picular response sustained from onset through week 52 with, an, uh, with anifrumab treatment compared with placebo. Uh, anifrumab resulted in a numerically for, uh, favorable differences in time to onset of picular response maintained through uh, week 52 across the TOLIB studies. Uh, these data support that sustainability of clinical benefit derived from anifrolumab treatment of patients with active systemic lupus uh, erythematosus. Now I will talk about this uh, another uh, other interesting study about successful withdrawal of uh, microphenolate mofetil in a quiescent uh, SLA. As we uh, know, uh, microphenolate mofetil has become a mainstay in the uh, long-term immunosuppression treatment. Uh, of lupus nephritis and other manifestations of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus. However, its prolonged use, of course, will be associated with uh, effect, uh, a significant cost and uh, adverse effects. And the other reason behind this study is that there is no uh, available evidence about withdrawing uh, microphenolate mofetil after a prolonged period of uh, disease uh, quiescence. This is the study overview. Uh, overview. Uh, it is a, a phase two uh, study, a uh, randomized trial in subjects with SLE. They targeted a total of 120 subjects, uh, and the study arms will, uh, were uh, microphenolate uh, mofetil withdrawal arm and microphenolate mofetil maintenance arm. The duration of the study was 60 weeks, and the primary endpoint was the prob uh, probability of clinically significant disease reactivation by 60 weeks. Uh, clinically significant uh, SLE reactivation uh, requires both uh, a selena slidae defined mild or moderate or severe flare plus an increased immune suppressive therapy. This is the subject, uh, subject distribution. As we said, they started with 123 uh, subjects and after a few terminations, they ended up with 49 patients in the maintenance group and 51 patients in the withdrawal group. This uh, table shows uh, the demographics and uh, baseline characteristics uh, in this study. And it's worth to mention that the disease duration by years, uh, or the mean uh, duration uh, by years was uh, 13 years. And more than 75% of patients were having history of lupus nephritis, which means that clearly the indication of using macronilate mofetil in these patients was due to renal indications. Uh, and regarding the mean du uh, duration of use of MMF was uh, around six and a half years. Also, uh, patients were having uh, a mean SLIDI of 2.2, uh, and 60% uh, of patients were having positive double strand DNA, and more than 25% of patients were, were having, or less than 25% of patients were having low confidence. Sir Abdul Aziz, probably we are approaching our time, so to try. Okay. I too long. Okay. Uh, the disease activation were uh, encountered in nine patients in the withdrawal group and uh, five patients in the maintenance group. However, the estimated difference was not significant, and the estimated uh, time to develop uh, disease reactivation was uh, 38 weeks in both groups, which means that 
tapering or withdrawing macronulate mofetil was not associated immediately with disease reactivation. Uh, this uh, figure shows that there is no difference and uh, the curves were overlapping between both groups and also there were uh, no significant adverse events in comparison to uh, both groups. So in a conclusion, withdrawal of MMF may be safely considered in the majority of lupus patients with prolonged quiescent disease. Uh, this study uh, is about hydroxychloroquine blood levels and its association with the risk of uh, developing thrombosis in SLE patients. As we know, all the studies uh, about hydroxychloroquine uh, levels were uh, or looked for the relation between the levels and the disease activity, cutaneous disease activity, or side effects like retinopathy. But this is the first study to study the relation between hydroxychloroquine levels and risk to develop thrombosis. In this slide, we can see all the uh, thrombotic events encountered in the cohort of patients of the study. Uh, they also looked uh, to a potential confou uh, confounders, and they uh, uh, found that hypertension and low complements, or low C3, are confounding factors of, uh, to increase the risk of thrombosis. In this uh, uh, plotting uh, figure, we can see that there is no relation between the prescribed uh, hydro hydroxychloroquine dose and the mean hydroxychloroquine blood level, which means that the prescribed dose cannot predict the uh, mean blood uh, level. Here we can see that uh, the uh, thrombotic events were significantly associated with lower hydroxychloroquine blood levels as compared with the higher uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine blood levels. Moreover, they, they found that the most recent hydroxychloroquine level prior to thrombotic event is more associated with uh, increased ric risk of thrombosis uh, as compared to the mean hydroxychloroquine blood level. Okay, here comes the question what uh, hydroxychloroquine blood level should, should we target? From this figure, we can say that uh, a, target, uh, a level of 1,000 up to 1,500 might be ideal uh, level. So in a conclusion, uh, the rates of thrombosis, uh, thrombosis will decrease by 13% for each increment uh, in the mean hydroxychloroquine level. <coughs> and uh, also it will be decreased by 13% with each 200 uh, increment by 200 nanogram per milliliter in most recent uh, level. Okay, I will go to the second part of my presentation about the periodic fever syndromes and other autoinflammatory diseases. Sorry for being uh, quick. Uh, <laughs> I will talk about uh, first uh, about this study about anti-interleukin uh, one treatment in cold GC resistant pediatric FMF patients. Real life data from the Helios registry. This is a study from Turkey, and the Helios registry is a registry uh, for uh, biologic uh, drugs uh, uh, that includes uh, pediatric rheumatology patients. They collected a total of 40 patients who received an anti interleukin 1 treatment over at least six months. They defined Cochise resistant as ongoing disease activity, uh, more than one attack per month for more th than three months, or very resistantly elevated CRP, while taking the maximum tolerated dose of Cochise. And the Cochise intolerant was defined as uh, not. Uh, or uh, inability to take the required dose due to gastrointestinal side effects or abnormal uh, laboratory uh, tests. The indication for on-demand on uh, treatment was based on the severe attacks with a pain intensity of a greater uh, or greater out uh, greater than uh, eight out of ten, with a high CRP due to certain uh, tr uh, tr uh, triggers like menstruation and intense stress periods. And the patients should be clinically normal with normal amyloid uh, level and CRP level between uh, the triggers. In the results, as we said, 40 patients were collected, 34 patients were in continuous treatment, and six were on demand treatment. 65% of patients were female, and 17.5 were uh, having a positive history of consanguin uh, consanguinity. And uh, regarding the continuously treated group, the age of uh, at start of purchasing treatment was 5.5, and the age at onset of anti-interleukin one treatment was 11.5, and the follow-up duration under uh, anti-interleukin one treatment was four years. Uh, 29 patients were resistant, and five patients were intolerant. 
Uh, in regards to the clinical features at the time of anti-interleukin uh, one, uh, onset, all, all, almost all patients were having fever and majority of patients were having abdominal pain and arthritis. And the most frequent mutation was the homozygous uh, mutation of uh, M694V. Uh, Okay, the treatment strategy, they, they used uh, anakinra uh, at a dosing of 2 mg per kg per day and kanakinumab 2 mg per kg per dose by month. If the patient is still having attacks, they increase the dose gradually. Anakinra was uh, maximally reached 100 mg per day and kanakinumab maximum dose 150 mg per month. In case patient was attack free for six months, anakinra was uh, spaced to be every other day and kanakinumab was faced every third month. At the, during the last visit, six patients only were on, an, an, uh, on anakinra and 28 patients were on kanakinoma. On-demand treatment, the best uh, drug for choice was anakinra. For adolescent females, uh, required three days of injection started from the first day of their menstruation with a dose of two milligram per kg per dose. One patient required a four days injections during the intense stress period with a dose also of 2 mg per kg per dose and one patient had lymphopenia during the continuous treatment and he was still having attacks with a maximum colchicine uh, dosing so he was treated with on-demand strategy with anakinra and he had no lymphopenia during the follow-up. These figures showed that the number of attacks and severity also of attacks were significantly in, uh, reduced with the anti-interleukin-1 uh, in uh, treatments. Also, uh, CRP levels, we can see that dramatically decreased with uh, anti-interleukin-1 treatment. In regards to safety issues, uh, local scary actions were, were <coughs> encountered in 11 patients with anakinra and uh, they were switched to kanakinumab. Uh, three hospitalization were due to minor infections. Leukopenia developed in two patients with anakinra and thrombocytopenia in one patient with kanakinumab and no malignancies were encountered. In a conclusion, this is uh, the largest uh, pediatric FMF series in the literature who were treated with anti-interleukin-1 uh, agent. Both anakinra and kanakinumab were effective and relatively safe in colchicine resistant and intolerant uh, pediatric FMF patients. On-demand anakinra is an option for FMF patients who have severe attacks with certain short-lasting uh, triggers like menstruation or stress periods. Okay, I will go now to this study, uh, study, which is a series of 290 uh, cases uh, or uh, nine, uh, 290 traps cases from the Eurofever and Eurotraps uh, International Registry. They looked for the long-term uh, outcome and treatment efficacy in these patients. Uh, they reviewed all data on patients with uh, TNFRSF1A uh, variant uh, enrolled in the Eurofever and Eurotraps International Registry until January 2018. And they analyzed the long-term outcomes uh, and treatment efficacy according to the new, uh, new international study group of systemic uh, auto-inflammatory disease uh, classification of gene variants and the Eurofever classification criteria. I'm sorry, Dr. Suleiman, but we, we need to highlight about this international study uh, group. Uh, this is the paper that was published in 2018. And the aim behind this uh, paper was uh, to co uh, collect experts' consensus uh, on the clinical significance of uh, gene variants of the uh, commonly known or the uh, most frequently uh, uh, or encountered uh, 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 recurrent or hereditary recurrent fever genes. They are uh, MEFB and MBK, NLRB3, and the TRABS gene. So they categorize each uh, gene variant with uh, uh, four uh, categories, either pathogenic, likely pathogenic, uh, variant of unknown significant, likely uh, benign, or benign. It's worth to mention that uh, the classification criteria for auto-inflammatory recurrent fevers, or uh, Eurofever classification criteria, was published last year. And this is the criteria we were uh, looking for. This is the criteria, and we can see how high uh, the sensitivity, specificity, and the accuracy of this criteria. Okay, we go back to the results of our study. So all patients who were carrying pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants of the TRAPS team were accounting around 56%, and they were fulfilling the Eurofever classification criteria. 
16% out of them developed amyloidosis. The patients who were carrying benign or likely benign variants were 9% and were not fulfilling the Eurofever classification criteria and they significantly presented with a milder disease. Among the patients who were carrying the variant but not significant or uh, the non-classified variant, uh, which are 35%, 50% of them didn't fulfill the Eurofever classification criteria as well, displaying lower uh, incidence of abdominal pain and higher efficacy rate of on-demand treatment with uh, NSAID and Cochisi. So uh, they concluded that interleukin-1 uh, uh, drug uh, were the most frequently used uh, in patients fulfilling the Eurofever classification criteria and with, the, uh, and with the highest efficacy rate, more than 85% complete response, while eternal set was less effective and discontinued in 65% of patients. No patients with anti-interleukin-1 treatment developed amyloidosis. And it will, it's worth to mention that, that diagnosis of TRAPS should be uh, considered very carefully in patients who are uh, not fulfilling the Euro uh, fever uh, classification criteria and that colchicine might be uh, a best drug of choice as a first-line treatment. I will just highlight this study for our colleagues to go back and check it in the website. Long-term efficacy and safety of canakinumab in patients with colchicine resistant familial Mediterranean fever result from the randomized phase three cluster trial was presented by Dr. Cesar Ozen and uh, in the part of uh, posters, there is uh, uh, an interesting poster about systematic review for the management of IL-1 mediated auto-inflammatory diseases. Here we come to the last part, and sorry for the delay. Uh, I uh, get it from the session, Novel Diagnostic and Therapeutic Approaches in Pediatric Rheumatic uh, Diseases. Uh, this study was uh, presented by our co Italian colleagues in Genoa, and they uh, looked for the use of whole body MRI to identify potential diagnostic clues in children with fever of unknown origin. Uh, as we know, fever of unknown origin uh, can be due to many uh, possible etiologies, either infectious, rheumatic diseases, malignancies, and in uh, at least 25% cases with uh, no diagnosis. And there is no gold standard diagnostic approach to uh, these cases. In regards to the whole body uh, MRI, it's a fast and accurate method for detecting and monitoring diseases throughout the entire body. And there is no risk of exposure to ionizing uh, radiation, and there is no contrast. Also, it has an emerging applications in the non-oncological fields. The objectives of this study, as we mentioned, they evaluated the ability of whole body MRI to identify significant potential diagnostic clues in patients presenting with fever of unknown origin and non specific inflammatory clinical picture. Uh, and all the other objective is to understand uh, if the evaluation of whole body MRI with a predefined checklist increased the power of this diagnostic tool. Uh, the patients and uh, methods, uh, it's, uh, this is a retrospective collection of pediatric patients followed by a single center in pediatric rheumatology. They looked for a whole body MRI that were done between the period from January 2010 and December 2015 for the following indications. The first indication is fever of unknown origin, defined as temperature greater than 38.3 for more than three weeks or failure to reach diagnosis after one week of investigation. The second uh, indication was recurrent fever, febrile episodes separated by periods of normal temperature. And the third indication was inflammation of unknown origin. Uh, and here they defined it as an illness of at least three weeks duration with raised inflammatory markers and fever below 38.3. Uh, this is the protocol they used in the whole body MRI. Okay. Each study underwent two evaluations, okay? And they uh, set a predefined checklist by an experience, uh, experienced uh, radiologist. And here we can see the potential diagnostic clues uh, uh, in a systematic way, starting by single bone lesions, multifocal bone lesions, bone marrow involvement, among others. So each study was evaluated twice. In terms uh, to the first evaluation, 24 patients were having fever of unknown origin according to the definition, uh, definition we just mentioned. Um, uh, among these uh, 24 patients, uh, 21 patients will have, uh, will, or were will, uh, will found to have a potential diagnostic clues. Uh, 
Among these uh, 21 patients, five patients uh, were having potential diagnostic clues with consist uh, which is consistent with the diagnosis, and two potential diagnostic clues that were diagnostic. Uh, also, 28 patients were having recurrent fever, and BDCs were found in 16 patients uh, out of them. Uh, um, uh, out of these 16 patients, four patients were having BDCs consistent with the diagnosis, and one patient was having a diagnostic BDC. Also, 52 patients were having inflammation of unknown origin. And uh, BDCs were found also in 41 out uh, of uh, these 52 uh, two patients. In 13 patients, it was consistent with the diagnosis, and in six patients, it was diagnostic. In the re-evaluation, uh, it was done blindly, according to the predefined checklist that we just uh, saw. And we can see that additional uh, BDCs in 52 patients were found. Actually, 12 out of them were having previously negative whole body MRI. In 10 cases, the BDCs were found after re-evaluation were consistent or contributory to the final diagnosis. Uh, here we can see that abdominal masses, uh, nervous system involvement, and vessels involvement are the most uh, 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 or the most uh, appropriate uh, uh, clues that were uh, associated with uh, either diagnosis or with consistent with diagnosis, followed by multifocal uh, bone lesions and joint effusions. However, tenosynovitis and uh, other manifestations were not uh, significant. In a conclusion, uh, whole body MRI identified a diagnostic BDCs in 12 patients and uh, a, consist, uh, a BDCs that were consistent with diagnosis in 27 patients, which uh, accounts 37% uh, of the cohort of the study. Uh, also, a predefined checklist increased the power of whole body MRI in the identification of BDCs, uh, adjunctive contributory BDCs in 10% of uh, the patients of cohort. However, this patient has its limitations being uh, a monocentric uh, uh, study and uh, 84 out of these pati uh, patients were referred for second opinion and being a retrospective study. But it could be the first study to underlie the benefit of whole body MRI use in, the, in this category of patients. And here uh, I can end my uh, uh, presentation and thank you all for listening. I'm sorry for the delay again, if there is any delay. Thank you, Abdelaziz. We understand it's a really difficult task to do all this. Uh, really, we appreciate your uh, efforts. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few questions here, but probably you, you need to tell us most of these uh, SLE studies from adults. Yes. So probably we don't know what is going on in children. Uh, I may ask you about uh, the side effects in the study of uh, tacrolimus versus uh, MMF. I don't hear you or maybe they don't uh, comment about it. No, uh, uh, I, they, uh, I, I'm not sure if they, maybe I, I skipped it. Uh, no, I didn't yeah, I come over it. But I'm sure they, they, they look for uh, the, the, the side effect of the uh, There is an interesting question. Uh, they said most of these cases, I mean, lupus patient, um, talking about nephritis. So who's supposed to follow the patient, the nephrologist or rheumatologist? Historically, lupus patient, including lupus nephritis, followed by rheumatologist. Is this something correct to do? Well, I believe it's a multidisciplinary ap uh, approach, and it should be a but collaborative teamwork. In reality, all cases handled by rheumatologists, including lupus nephritis. You think this is appropriate? Myself, yes. Okay. <laughs> Maybe other people they have different opinion, but the ideal thing to have joint clinic. This is the sure. ideal thing because still we are rheumatologists. The nephrology, they should give their input. Uh, there is another question regarding re uh, nephritis. Whatever the medication have been given, tacrolimus, MMF, or belimumab, or rituximab, or cyclophosphamide. The question: How frequent we should 
consider repeating renal biopsy? Is it related to the flare or to monitor the disease? Uh, I mean, the treatment response. Of course, uh, every patient will undergo uh, a frequent evaluation in terms of uh, lab uh, works and clinical evaluation in the clinic. And based on any abnormal finding that uh, might raise a possibility of any renal flare, I think it's a good indica indication to repeat the renal uh, biopsy, specif specifically, uh, specifically if it's a significant uh, renal involvement or uh, renal uh, um, disease. So when I will give you a rest. Probably we can ask Dr. Reem uh, because we rushed you in al we, we didn't give you enough time. To be fair with you, we need to give some questions. You mentioned, Dr. about the biomarkers. Uh, it may be used as a, a treatment a response to monitor the treatment response or maybe for diagnostic purposes, namely mass. But do you think this is, uh, in real practice, is it available or maybe limited to certain labs at this time? Of course, it's very limited. I think it's, it's available only in higher centers. Um, I'm not very sure about the other centers here, but in my own center, we don't have even interleukins uh, level to be done. Okay. Yeah, to, to, to <laughs> the best of my knowledge, and in many centers, and probably this is at the research level, it's not uh, in clinical yeah. use yet. Yeah. There is, a, there is another question, maybe they try to link COVID with the systemic GIA. Uh, <laughs> I will read that, so I couldn't uh, understand it well. Uh, is cytokine profile is recommended in COVID? Maybe he, he want to ask, would you run the cytokine profile in systemic GIA. He said maybe it's, uh, I mean, disease flare, flare rather than COVID manifestation. You mean a patient known as systemic GIA? Well, no, no yeah. this is a new patient, new patient. A new patient fulfilling the criteria of systemic GIA, I would run uh, the diagnosis of systemic GIA. Plus, I think every patient coming now with fever, we go for, um, um, COVID-19 um, uh, um, 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 test, but um, whether to run the other labs and the cytokines level, I'm not very sure. Okay. Mr. Abdelaziz, back to you. There is a question regarding whole body MRI. Um, they asked about the age of those patients. Do you call that the age? Uh, unfortunately, it was not... Uh mentioned if i remember correctly there are uh, they are different some of them they are too young they are uh, others are old enough so that they are uh, it's not uh, limited to small kids because they, they thought i mean the, the, the one who asked the question he thought about the age is it i mean indication of growth and the risk of sedation versus for diagnosis but in that uh, report that they gave different ages uh, there is a one question regarding this lupus nephritis study. Do you think changes definition of renal response affect the result compared to previous medication trials? Uh, I'm not sure. There is no evidence about this yet, so difficult to judge about uh, this. But what we can get, uh, make sure about is that bilumumab is a promising drug also. Uh, for use in uh, lupus nephritis. Okay. Um, again, uh, regarding uh, auto-inflammatory FMF, the trial of the I mean, use of uh, anti-IL-1 in uh, colchicine resistance. So what is the definition of severe disease? They said you can or they recommend to use it in severe disease. What, this is, this do they use the activity index in those patients? No, uh, it was uh, the on-demand treatment. You, you know, really Abdelaziz, there is disease activity index or score sure. for FMS. Yes, yes. Did they, did they use it in their study? I didn't come uh, across it in this study. They didn't mention it. Um, 
يعطيكم العافيه اي دونت سي مور كويشنز ات ذا اند ريلي اي شود ثانك بوث اوف يو دكتور ارين دكتور عبد العزيز فور ذيس جريت ايفورت اي نو تو تاب تو سامرايز اند جو ثرو اول ذيس ابستراكت اند سيشنز ثانك يو فيري ماتش اند ريلي ابريشيت ثانك يو سو ماتش ثانك يو ثانكس ثانك يو فيري ماتش ثانك يو سو ماتش سلام عليكم Thank you.